On today's World Insight, the U.S.'s special envoy for the DPRK meets South Korean President Moon Jae-in in Seoul. How will Biden's approach to the DPRK differ from his predecessor's showmanship? And as the world rushes to understand a rapidly developing China, we speak to a foreign China expert to find out how to peer through the veil and comprehend Chinese culture. Here's our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Diplomatic moves are taking place on the Korean Peninsula. U.S. Special Representative for DPRK, Sung Kim, has met with South Korean President Moo Jae-in. The two discussed the issues concerning Pyongyang. On Monday, the U.S. envoy said Washington hoped to receive a positive response from the DPRK on a proposal for negotiations. We continue to hope that the DPRK will respond positively to our outreach and our offer to meet anywhere, anytime, without preconditions. But he has also said that the U.S. would continue to impose tough sanctions against the DPRK. U.S. President Joe Biden has extended long-existing U.S. sanctions on DPRK for another year. DPRK leader Kim Jong-un said in a recent speech that the country must be ready for both dialogue and confrontation. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said that there was an, quote, interesting signal in the speech. Kim Yo-jong, a influential figure in the DPRK system, responded on Tuesday saying the U.S. had unrealistic expectations which would leave the country disappointed. An uncertain time for U.S. DPRK relations and the Korean Peninsula denuclearization. Will it bring changes to regional geopolitics? That's Lupien, our panelists. For Korean Peninsula in Washington, D.C., Sharon Squazoni the research professor at the Institute for International Science and Technology Policy at the George Washington University. In D.C., Yang Ki Kim Reno, senior advisor at the Institute for Korean Studies in the George Washington University. In Washington, D.C. as well, Peter Kuznick, professor and director at Nuclear Studies Institute with American University. Last but not least in Beijing, Zhao Tong, senior fellow at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy. Ladies and gentlemen, what a pleasure to see all of you you a lot of latest development regarding the Korean Peninsula. For example, Ms. Squasoni, the latest visit by the U.S. Special Representative for North Korea with uh, his South Korean counterpart. Much analysis about exactly what's the significance of that visit. Well, I think you have to step back a little bit. Um, okay. First, it's very significant that Sung Kim was made the representative mm. <laughs> since he is an extremely seasoned diplomat. He's done this a few times before. Um, as a matter of fact, he served as the U.S. ambassador to South Korea. And second, this trip um, to visit um, South Korea, you know, with meeting with Korean and Japanese allies, is all about showing that we will stand with our allies uh, with respect to North Korean policy. But I think it's all positive that uh, this is moving so early I in the see. administration. One of the things that he and the South Korean counterparts did to scrap off a mechanism, so-called a special group on North Korea and sanctions, which DPRK has been complaining about because it's mainly about putting sanctions on the DPRK. Now, is that going to be a positive step forward or it is mainly decorations and gestures? I think this probably uh, symbolizes an effort that they are uh, willing to start in a way in a little different direction than so far. So I guess details are to be seen. 
Very interesting. I love the way you put it in such a measured words. Mr. Zhao, I want to go to you about that. Uh, do you see that very little change of direction, or it is mainly the same logic, just put it in very different context? Well, I, I think the working group was set up uh, during the Trump administration, if I remember correctly. Uh, the main uh, goal was originally to uh, coordinate between U.S. and South Korea uh, about uh, what uh, inter-Korean economic projects uh, or activities can be exempted uh, from sanctions. Yeah. That was during a time uh, when there was some hope of a quick and a substantial inter-Korean economic exchange. But now I think uh, this, the ending of this working group in some sense is a recognition of a new fact where no one is really expecting major developments, especially uh, in the economic arena. Uh, there is no sign that there is going to be new and big inter-Korean economic projects. Uh, so there is nothing to really talk about, mm -hmm. about in terms of uh, ex uh, exempting such uh, projects from uh, international sanctions. So I, I, I read it as a, as a signal that, uh, you know, we probably won't see much uh, positive development uh, in terms of uh, relaxing sanctions on North Korea. Mm. And we're seeing also quite uh, paralleled uh, reactions coming from the DPRK. Uh, I would focus on the use of name of DPRK because how, that's how uh, the DPRK considers should be respected uh, for their, the name, uh, but you can go with the, whatever form you like. Um, coming from the foreign minister of uh, DPRK, quote, we are not considering even the possibility of any contact with the U.S., let alone having it, which would get us nowhere, only taking up precious time, end of quote. That is from the official news agency, KCNA, from the DPRK. Mr. Kuznick, professor, is that much surprise? Or the DPRK has learned from earlier bites dealing with the Trump administration? <clears throat> well, it's not a big surprise, but it's also not the best news we might hope for. Uh, Soon Kim had said he's ready to meet with the DPRK officials anywhere, anytime, without preconditions. But the response from the DPRK was, well, we'll meet with you when we're ready under our own conditions and our own terms. We'll set the terms of this relationship. So right now there's kind of a posturing going on and uh, it's gonna take a little while before something concrete develops. So I think we've gotta be patient. We really need to know the other party in order to make a progress in either dialogue or communication. So, Ms. Squasoni, if, as far as I understand, covering several uh, Kim Trump summit in Singapore, in Vietnam, I saw almost none U.S. concessions. Uh, well, the DPRK claimed that it has made its effort. So, without removing the earlier sanctions against DPRK, without making sure there's going to be adequate exchange of conditions between the two sides, Washington and Pyongyang. One would really wonder why would DPRK want to have any discussion with Washington anyway, Mrs. Guasoni? Well, I think their interest in discussing anything with Washington is related to the sanctions, obviously. And, you know, in Hanoi, uh, Kim Jong-un offered to close down Yangbyon in exchange for having all the sanctions lifted from 2016. And North Korea has been under U.S. sanctions <laughs> since 1950. But the Trump administration really ratcheted those up. And, um, you know, I don't blame them for feeling uh, burned by the Trump administration because, frankly, Mr. Trump promised a lot of things. I mean, the Singapore summit was quite, you know, he was quite expansive mm. of talking about a new relationship with North Korea. But they've got to, I, I'm sure that some kind of sanctions relief uh, is the first thing they're going to ask for. And the question is, what is the Biden administration willing to put on the table? We have not seen um, 
the United States, uh, its relations uh, with Iran, with the DPRK, with uh, some of the hotspot issues, and of course with Russia and China, have been in any way improved, but rather probably even deteriorated over the past few months. With that as reference, Mr. Zhao, do you see much confidence that the DPRK could have about this uh, current administration, even though many people want to blame the Trump administration? Well, I, I think uh, for the um, credit of the Biden administration, it uh, did uh, a North Korea policy review, uh, which was generally welcomed um, uh, by uh, you know American experts as well as other uh, countries in this region, especially uh, South Korea, Japan, uh, etc. I think a key uh, point of the Biden's no new North Korea policy is to be willing to embrace the incremental approach of uh, achieving uh, denuclearization. Uh, that is a major change from the uh, all or nothing approach of the Biden administration. Uh, Biden emphasizes repeatedly that uh, U.S. is willing to uh, diplomacy with North Korea um, and has des designated a special uh, representative um, and starting coordination with the allies. I think all those are positive signals. However, uh -huh. from the North Korean perspective, I also understand uh, they don't think that is enough. Uh, the recent uh, statement from uh, the uh, party plenum um, during which the North Korean leadership basically said North Korea needs to be prepared for both dialogue and confrontation. Well, some read that as, as a positive uh, signal from North Korea, but I think um, it would be more accurate to say that North Korea was repeating the same rhetoric that uh, the ball is in the American court. So North Korea basically wants to see some concrete proposal from the U.S. Right. to have an understanding what substantive uh, benefit North Korea can expect mm. if diplomacy starts. So I, I hope uh, Biden can put something uh, more, more substantive on the uh, on the table to attract North Korea. To I love that word, the substantive. So, Professor Kuznick, what could be in the substance that Washington can propose? Of course, I'm not saying you're representing the White House, but I'm just saying as an expert. What could be in that first message? And it's very confusing for other countries to deal with the United States when it comes to foreign policy, because our policies change so frequently. With each new administration, we get a change in policy. So that's very disorienting. Uh, but clearly, Biden wants to differentiate himself from Trump. So as we were saying, there's not going to be this grand bargain. We're not going to talk about complete uh, denuclearization in exchange for peace and sanctions. We're going to be looking for an incremental approach. Now, there are various things that both sides can offer. For example, the, the United States, clearly what, what the DPRK wants is a reduction in sanctions. Right. But it also wants peace on the peninsula. You know, the, we're still technically at war. We have not ended the Korean War yet. We still have just that arms disagreement. So there are things that can be offered in terms of economic relief, as well as political relief and in terms of moving the peninsula toward peace. Mm -hmm. Ms. Kim Reno? President Biden's uh, strategy is maybe uh, ultimate to denuclearization, but not the condition for the talk to go on because that way everybody can get out of this uh, catch-22 situation. So uh, probably it's more pragmatic and realistic. President Biden has a long experience with yeah. foreign policy and uh, he also relies on real experts uh, rather than trying to make all the decisions himself. So this is a natural consequence, trying to take incremental and, uh, uh, you know, positive uh, thinking that something can come out of the, the real dialogue, as I have repeated many times. I see. We, we need to convince uh, 
each other of the sincerity we have. Can I, can I understand this incremental, if I put it in such a blunt way, because I cannot afford it, I'm a journalist. That means almost nothing happens except to create a good nuance, an atmosphere. Ms. Squasoni? So y you would be right to be a little skeptical <laughs> of incremental mm. <laughs> as progress, a girl, as I but, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But, but there are things I think that would really be helpful. So one is under the agreed framework, North Korea froze the plutonium portion of its program and it had international inspectors on the ground. They have not been there for a long time. Focusing on Yangbyon, that facility where they do, where there's a reactor and a reprocessing plant and some enrichment, that's not a bad idea. I think, though, we need to do more than that. But getting international inspectors on the ground could be quite helpful. It's, you know, the Biden administration has said, look, it's not the grand bargain from the Trump administration, but I think they learned the lesson from the Obama administration that strategic patients only results in North Korea continuing to build up its program. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, in January of this year, Kim Jong-un gave a speech in which he, it was almost as if he were imitating Vladimir Putin, where he talked about all these fabulous new weapons that, you know, North Korea was going to have, including hypersonic glide vehicles and multiple warheads. You know, I think he almost thinks, look, you know, we have to sort of, um, I don't want to say exaggerate, well, exaggerate the threat in order to get the U.S. attention. But, but I do think that there's a lot, there's a lot of space to make some significant progress. Like what? Well, so one, getting inspectors on the ground, two, building confidence. I would say that... Um, Rather the other way around, building confidence first and then get inspectors on the ground. Uh, I think they go together. <laughs> <laughs> it has I think, to, right? yes, there is a certain, you know, and actually that's why I think that Sung Kim is a fantastic person to do this because he's been there before. They, you know, it, it's actually hopefully helpful that, you know, they recognize him, they know him, you know, there, there's, there's a history right. there. So maybe that can help build a little bit of confidence. I would love to um, focus on the capabilities of individuals because that usually gives us a lot of hope. But we have to also look at the bigger picture, uh, the geopolitical picture, for example. What we have now, very much different from a few years ago. China and the United States both are important parties in that uh, uh, the uh, decolonization uh, group now we have seen the, between them a very much unpredictable future uh, and things are going deteriorating every day as we see it. Um, meanwhile, uh, there is an issue about what the U.S. is likely to do with its allies vis-a-vis -vis the DPRK, vis-a-vis -vis China in the Asia Pacific region. South Korea's fate in that regard uh, will be also unpredictable depending on what its choice is and how it's likely to be, you know, uh, related to many other players in the region. And we also see China-Japan relations not necessarily improving under these current circumstances. Meanwhile, the pandemic. So all of things added up. What are we talking about in terms of the Korean Peninsula future? Mr. Zhao. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. I was in a few expert level dialogues uh, with American experts, South Korean experts, etc. They uh, all emphasized one thing, which is the importance uh, to have uh, U.S. China coordination on North Korea policy as soon as possible. Uh, people all recognize the importance of the two major powers being on the same page and have a coordinated uh, policy uh, towards North Korea. Uh, Biden has made an important uh, summit with Russian President Putin. Everyone is now talking about when Biden will meet with the Chinese president. Mm -hmm. And if they do so in the near term future, I think they really should put North Korea uh, in their uh, discussion agenda. And um, well, I, I guess you are not asking me about South Korea, so I'll leave it to other experts. Yes. About South Korea, I want to go to you, Ms. Kim Reno. It's, it's in a tricky situation, but denuclearization certainly in the interest of South Korea. 
South Korea also want to have good relationship with China because China, South Korea trade and uh, neighborhoods, these are all very important to South Korea. But what about that? I really cannot speak for the South Korean. No, uh, but just as an observer. Uh, I think it can also be an opportunity. They are political and economical and, and other uh, significance in the world stage is uh, increasingly being recognized and they are playing the role that they probably had not previously required of mm -hmm. the world situation right and they are capable of uh, making a difference these days back to south korea south korea is always in a delicate position uh, south korea is not playing into u.s hands entirely on this south korea has not joined the quad south korea is not working to contain and isolate china in the same way that Japan and Australia and the U.S. are doing, and India, now with India. Uh, so South Korea is, South Korea is in a, a difficult situation. It is actually participating mm -hmm. in the sea breeze operation in the Black Sea with the U.S. and 31 other countries right now. But it is not playing the same game vis-a-vis -vis China. South Korea uh, just so, just made uh, public that uh, it is its name is there, but it's not sending any specific uh, presence in that military operation. By the way, uh, this is uh, the latest from South Korea. But don't let me interrupt you. Go ahead, sir. But the context that you were talking about, the geostrategic situation, the U.S. is maintaining its policy toward China. Uh, that, that many of the people in the Biden administration go back to the Obama administration. And some of them are pretty hawkish. Uh, but the thing that they all agreed on was the pivot toward China, the pivot toward Asia, mm. a containment policy toward China. One of the key policymakers is Kurt Campbell, who really was the architect of that policy. But even people like Blinken, and Sullivan were part of that. You also, in my view, have a, a counterweight, and that's Wendy Sherman, who played a more positive role, both in terms of the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA, but also in terms of earlier negotiations with North Korea. Mm -hmm. So, and, and Biden himself, I don't know for sure where he comes out, because he, in some ways, is a more, has been a voice for less military confrontational policies and in some ways he's gone along with some of those I policies see. so from china's perspective mr Zhao, where is the korean peninsula nuclear issue um i think china feels um positive about the the new biden policy on north korea uh, the incremental approach basically aligns uh, well with china's proposal for a phased step-by-step uh, -step approach to resolve North Korea's nuclear problem. Uh, so I think that creates opportunity uh, for better coordination with the United States. I think the key uh, challenge from the Chinese perspective is, uh, is the sequencing issue, who to make the first step. Um, and here, uh, maybe US and China can talk more uh, substantively with each other uh, North Korea expects some more substantial offer from the U.S., and, and maybe uh, China can work with the United States to jointly offer some vaccines or medical aids to North Korea uh, as, a, as an inducement uh, for North Korea to come back to the negotiating table. Then it's up to U.S. and North Korea to discuss you know, how they are going to uh, uh, respectively implement the incremental approach. The latest development on the human rights is quite intense. If you look at the, the uh, uh, Human Rights uh, uh, Commission's uh, uh, discussion right now that is taking place at the United Nations, it seems that China and U.S. Uh, have been accusing one another of uh, human rights issues. Uh, will that create a good atmosphere for uh, anything or uh, human rights will be the thing that's likely to block everything from going forward or countries will use human rights as uh, one of those tools uh, for their own benefits uh, these 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 are very interesting to me 
means that squaws right, right. Well, that's that's always the danger that they, you know, that that there's too much linkage. Mm. Um, so, and I don't. There are very few countries on this planet that uh, don't have some human rights issues. President Biden has long been <clears throat> has has a long track record on human rights, and so I would just note that as a it's a possible wrench in the works somewhere down the line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this was on the agenda with Russia. Um, and Mr. Biden did not shy away from that. It could be problematic with China and certainly with North Korea. Earlier when we discussed the Korean Peninsula nuclear issue, there are several areas that people know that they could focus on and solve the problem. But now we have so many moving factors right in front of us on any of these areas. And it makes policy discussions fascinating, but certainly reality is hard to deal with. But I want to thank every one of you for your expertise and your insights. By the way, also constructive spirits. Mm, Sharon Squasony, Yang Ki, Kim Reno, Peter Kuznick, and last but not least, Zhao Tong, thank you so much. Take care. Our earlier discussion on the Korean Peninsula. You're watching World Insight. Coming up, as the world rushes to understand a rapidly developing China, we speak to a foreign China expert, finding out how to peer through the veil and comprehend Chinese culture. Welcome back. This is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. Some have been trying to reach quick conclusions about China using one or two adjectives to describe a country with a few thousand years history and fasted involving society. I'm afraid that is a bit short of accuracy. That's also Hirio Ardino, the president of the Council on Pacific Affairs, also the advisor to the president of French Polynesian things. After studying traditional Chinese medicine for years and trying to speak the language as accurate as he can, he said there are entry points to understand China. For example, get things done in the most efficient way. Let's hear his thoughts. I know that you've been doing a lot of research about Chinese traditional medicine. Tell me more about how you got to know China through this very special window opportunity. Yes, so I lived in, uh, in Africa, in Madagascar, and uh, when I was a young boy, I wanted to be useful to others with uh, very little logistics. You know, we were living up in the countryside with no roads, etc. So I got very much interested in Chinese medicine because you could help others with almost nothing. You know, your bare hands, a few needles, and knowing... Uh, uh, so I felt that I needed to do that. Mm -hmm. So my, my passion for China went through the Chinese medicine. So then I went to China in 1987. Mm -hmm. Being a foreigner, I, I, I'm sure that I lost many things in translations, <laughs> as we say. So, <laughs> but, uh, but I have this love for Chinese medicine and uh, uh, I keep it with me, even though I don't practice anymore, you know, but uh, it has been a very, very solid basis for me as interaction and to understand people and to understand the world better, I hope. So you have a merciful teacher, right? To say the least. I had, <laughs> they were the, I would say one of the best humans I've met were my teachers in Chinese medicine back at school in uh, Yunnan Zhong Yichiren. They were just extraordinary people, you know, we were back uh, in the late 80s, you know, so China was very different from, from now. And um, I was the only foreigner, you know, in the school, so uh, people were extremely protective about me, you know, so, so th there was a whole group, you know, so I, I really felt uh, the warm-hearted uh, nice niceness you know uh, expressing uh, all over me 
Talking about China, you learned traditional Chinese medicine. Earlier, you told me when you, we were doing this pre-communication before the interview, you said effectiveness. That's how you would use the standard to test the impact of traditional Chinese medicine. Tell me more about that, and tell me more about how, from that angle, you are seeing China, how China is run, the governance styles of China, the priorities of China, and how the Chinese people think. Yes, uh, you know, so, so I remember a joke of one of my Chinese medical teachers, and uh, we were, uh, I was a translator for him, and we had a group of Western doctors, and we were visiting a Chongyi uh, uh, hospital in, 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 in Yunnan. And uh, in this group of Western doctors, you had those people, you know, with a bit of a smile on the, on the side of the face, you know, like uh, not believing in it. And, but you had people who were curious though, you know, and they wanted to learn a bit more. And you had the people who were totally closed up, you know, so, so you have those, those, those two categories of people. <laughs> and one of my teachers said as a joke, uh, the problem with Westerners is that they ask, it works in practice, but in theory, does it work? You know, and, and, and I found that thought very intelligent. And so, so it is true that a Chinese uh, uh, theory is, is a bit difficult to understand, you know, Tianhe, etc., the five elements, and, and how, how, how the outside world you know, has such an impact on us, you know, and what is the meridians, what are the uh, acupuncture points. But the fact is, at the end of the day, it works. So for me, the effectiveness is something which is probably the most important, and we should put away, you know, all the other uh, ideas and ideals that people might have. So this is what uh, I think is so strong about China, is that, you know, uh, effectiveness, you know. So, and of course, you know, when you are going to cross the river, you know, you're going to get uh, your shoes wet. So you have to be careful of, of, of where you, you step, but the goal is to be able to go on, on the other side. So I think this is something that uh, uh, we really need uh, to learn. But it seems that before we were saying that uh, 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 communist countries, I would say, you know, they were locked up, you know, in a sort of frame of mind, you know, that they could not es escape and see reality. I, I find that today the, the, the opposite is true. It seems that uh, uh, China was able to see how the world I is functioning. And what is, I think, the most important is that China is able to adapt, able to adapt to the current circumstances, you know, of the day. And this is, I think, the great power of China is that adaptability. Because people, I think, were, were chosen also uh, for that adaptability. As now in Western countries, you know, we are so locked up in our ideals that it, it, when those ideas do not work, you know, we try, you know, to find ways to explain why, but the, it, it, it's so difficult to, 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 to advance. But, but talking about that, I, I think that the future of the world, you know, in, in Western countries, you have the, the woke, uh, which is going on, all those racial issues and uh, this extensive equality, you know. For example, in official documents, they want to take away the word mother, you know, the word father, you know, just to put parents, you know. So we're going to such a, an extreme that I believe that uh, there's going to be bridges that are going to be able to be built, you know, uh, besides, you know, ideology of, of how the system works. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see on how that is going to work out. How do you see the Chinese Communist Party has managed to find its effective approach toward the evolving situations of China and how China interacts with the rest of the world? Back in the late uh, 80s, uh, when, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, I remember that very clearly. 
there was a there was a movement saying that it was the end of history, you know, the end of history as, uh, as we actually thought, that the world tomorrow is going to be a capitalist, you know, neoliberal system, and uh, that this is going to gain all over the world, and we're all going to live like that uh, forever. So that was a very sad uh, prospect. And then uh, China came along, and it, it, it caught everybody off guard. And, uh, and, and the problem is, I think today, we are still in this a bit off guard uh, 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 situation, at least uh, of the Western powers. And uh, when you look at the defense, you know, white papers of, of, of the Pacific uh, countries, it's, uh, it's very aggressive. So I think it's very important for, for all of us, you know, to be able to, to, to sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know that China is, is doing that, you know, when you look at the white papers of China, when you look at the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the idea behind all of that is, is, is try to, to find a balance, you know, between all of us and, and, and to be able to, to share, uh, share the future together. So, 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 so peace only works when, when the different sides want the peace. Right. So the difficulty is going to be when one side doesn't want it, then, uh, then, then, then what do you do? So I, I think this 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, of course, is a very important time for the Chinese people. I mean, there is so much to be proud of. But I think it's a very important uh, maybe moment and occasion to share your success uh, with the outside world. Dr. Ottino, you are painting a very challenging but realistic picture in front of us about what exactly the realities are uh, today. And therefore, do you think it's too much wishful thinking to have so-called a peaceful international environment for China from now on? Uh, do people want that peaceful environment with China? I mean, <laughs> this, this I think is, is, is the most important question mm. because uh, I mean, up to now, China has been extremely peaceful. So you have never been on a, on a, on a outside leading action. So I think this is very important to, 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 to showcase. But more importantly, uh, uh, you have succeeded because you were focused on, 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 on yourselves, I would say, no? to, to be able to lift China up. And uh, I remember a saying of, of Teng Xiaoping, I think he said, you know, uh, socialism, you don't have to be poor and weak, you know, and I think China has absolutely, absolutely shown that. And uh, today, China uh, should be an example for the other countries. But can the other countries uh, understand what is going on in China? This is, uh, this is I think, uh, the most difficult part. And I, I really hope, as a foreigner, that for your 100th anniversary, an anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party, you may explain, you know, how you have succeeded. For me, one of the most important uh, success is, it's very difficult to measure, is, is, uh, is, uh, is unity that was in China, you know? This is, uh, and of course there were sacrifices, you know? Uh, uh, people, uh, 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 suffered, you know, to be able to achieve what they are today. But, but it has been done in, in, in a wonderful spirit, you know, and, uh, and this, this emotion, it's very difficult to talk about it when you do not live in, in, in China, you know, when, when you have seen that happen at, at, at every corner of, of the country. One of the things that China has been proud of over the past decades about its people-centered. Now, uh, how much the policies really apply to it uh, at different stages of development, there might be various of degrees, but how do you see that as working as an accountability and credibility system for the Chinese Communist Party when it is facing the public 
is supposed to serve, which is the Chinese people. I would like to step back a bit. Uh, in, 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 in Western democracies, you know, we live in a world of lobbyists. And, uh, and, and when you ask Americans, for example, over 80% of the people believe that lobbyists have too much power inside the systems. In, in fact, in a society, what is the most important is that the people are happy. So, 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 so I think when you talk about people-centered, the whole goal is how can you make your population happy? So you as a public servant, you know, you mustn't work, you know, half-heartedly, you know, and, and try to find your little self-interest in the whole idea. You know, you have to focus entirely into your work. And I think uh, when I hear people-centered, I hear this. You know, it's when you work for the people, it's, it's not a work, you know, it should be a commitment. And the other point is that uh, when you're people-centered, in, in, in my view, the, what, you're putting the lobbyist away. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so the, 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 the big interests, you know, are taken out of the picture. And I think this is a, this is a huge challenge for the West to be able to, to, to achieve that, especially mm. today. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more research World Insight or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching. Bye for now.